So, my great pleasure to introduce Tom Robinson. He's uh, internationally renowned for his solution-oriented research, developing and evaluating effective health promotion and disease prevention interventions for children and adolescents and their families. He's been the director of the LPCH Center for Healthy Weight since 2005, and he's an extraordinary publication and grant record. For our purposes today, he was uh, notably the PI of the 2009 NORC application uh, as proposed center director. He earned the only exceptional uh, review of any of the different categories uh, that we were ranked on. So he was our highest ranking player. He's agreed to do it again, and he's going to share some of his thoughts now and come back uh, and actually close out the whole session in the afternoon with some clinical insights. And I think we're ready to go. Okay. All right, I was going to uh, move on to talking um, a little bit about behavior. And in particular, one area of the work that we've been doing um, that I call stealth interventions. Uh, so to, to cut to the chase, what I've been um, working on is really motivation, the motivation to change behavior. And, and there are really two types of motivation in the way we see it. The first is motivation to adopt the new behavior or the outcome, and I refer to that as outcome motivation. And the second is motivation to participate in the intervention itself that produces that change, and I call that process motivation. Now, in general, I think we do a pretty good job of focusing on outcome motivations to try and get people to, to change, to achieve the ultimate outcomes of the interventions. But I think, in general, our interventions have not been particularly successful at, at uh, focusing on process, uh, inter on process motivation. So some examples, motivation for physical activity and eating behaviors. In general, from a medical and public health perspective, we focus on the things that are important to us. Um, obesity, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, risk for future disease, and, and those are the outcomes. And we, we tell our patients and we tell the public that they need to change their behavior because they want to prevent these things. And these are the, the terrible things that we worry about. Well, it turns out, and as is sort of obvious from looking at the population and what's happened to our health status, is that these things have not been particularly motivating for people or sufficiently motivating to change their behaviors. And so when you look at other areas of research that where they study in, in the laboratory, for example, motivation, and in particular something that's been referred to as intrinsic motivators, you see these type of things come up. And regardless of the ultimate uh, behavioral outcome you're interested in, these types of things tend to be intrinsically motivating to get people to participate in intervention. Things like um, fun and taste in our, um, in our area of obesity or our physical activity and diet. Um, perceived choice and perceived control of behavior, um, goals, curiosity and challenge and setting appropriate challenges, uh, cooperation and competition, social interaction, pride and sense of accomplishment, peer social approval and disapproval, um, parent or adult approval or disapproval when you're dealing with kids, and also um, even personal appearance, which is something we frequently stay away with, especially, away from, especially in pediatrics, because we're worried about eating disorders. But these are things that are highly um, motivating or intrinsically motivating to change behavior and have been demonstrated across a whole bunch of different um, areas of behavior. So as you'll notice, none of those things on the right side actually are linked at all to, to health or, uh, or to health outcomes. So. I've asked the question, does a health behavior change intervention um, need to look, feel, sound, smell, or taste like health education? In fact, you have to deal with the issue of health at all to change behaviors that would produce outcomes related to health. And so that's why I call these stealth interventions, because from the perspective of the participant, physical activity or reduced inactivity or changes in diets are really side effects of the intervention. From us, that's our primary objective, but from the participant's point of view, there are side effects of what they're doing if you're not focusing on those as the primary outcomes. So the goal in developing interventions around this is that if we can identify target behaviors that are really motivating in themselves. So can we have healthful behaviors that people will participate in because they want to or because of other reinforcing um, aspects or, or uh, properties of them as opposed to because it's good for them. Because in fact, telling people that it's good for you doesn't seem to be doing the job. So 
first example, and I'm glad that Barr Taylor is here because he was the, um, an inspiration for this, uh, this study many uh, years ago. And this is, a, I like to show this because this is a medical student's project. Rose Flores, who is a medical student here about uh, 10 or 15 years ago, and Barr was her advisor, and she also worked with Larry Hammer. Um, and she was a dance instructor and wanted to substitute dance for uh, PE in local schools. So um, with her, we helped her do this project in McNair Middle School in East Palo Alto, where she randomized children to either be in their standard PE or be in a special dance class. And it only lasted for 12 weeks. It was still three times per week, 40 to 50 minutes per day, um, just during the regular PE period of time. And uh, first of all, there were, we found that, that with seventh graders, there were no effects in boys. But in girls, if you had them uh, dance, which is something that's highly, much more motivating to them than being part of the PE class and exercising because they were, it was PE, um, we found over just 12 weeks, significant differences between the group randomly assigned to the dance class and a group who was uh, continued in the regular PE program, just over a 12-week period of time. We extended that um, to some other studies where we were doing, this is a study in African-American girls uh, called GEMS, where again, just over a 12-week period of time, we saw um, substantial changes in, uh, between girls who were randomized to a dance, after-school dance program, which focused on hip-hop, step, and African dance, and, those, uh, and also reducing their television time at home, um, compared to girls who are randomized to just receiving education about nutrition or what we would standardly treat people with. So nutrition education we use as a control group here and we see about half as much of an increase in body mass index or waist circumference. We extended this to a two-year study in Oakland with, uh, with 260 families and actually we had a lot of implementation challenges so not everything we do works as smoothly as, as, smoothly as we would like but um, in a we did not see actually differences in BMI or waist circumference in that study in Oakland, but in fact we did see significant reductions to this intervention with dance and, and screen time reduction in total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and related to the last uh, talk, to Dr. Reven's talk, in, in fasting insulin rates, even without changes in the BMI from this intervention, increasing dance, or using dance as a form of physical activity and uh, reducing screen time. The, um, uh, in fact, it was significant. We chose, as Dr. Reven talked about, there's no standard definition for what uh, insulin should be, but at a, uh, for, for kids, we often use a cutoff of 30 milligrams per deciliter at that level, a significant difference between the, the treatment group and the control group. And you can see here that if you look at the two green lines, which were the baseline measures of fasting insulin, uh, for the two groups, and then you look at the blue lines, which were the post-test two years later, um, the follow-up measures, with the dashed line being health education, the solid line being the dance and TV reduction intervention, you can see how those distributions shift quite a bit um, just with this real public health intervention focusing on, a, on this stealth intervention as opposed to focusing specifically on health. Um, I wanted to give you a little taste of this, and this is another study that we've been doing that is, actually we just finished, that was doing the same type of intervention with uh, Mexican-American girls in Redwood City, and this is using Ballet Folklorico, uh, which is uh, uh, traditional Mexican um, folk dances. I don't know if you can hear the sound. Can you? But the idea is developing this program for the, the after-school sites, um, focusing on the culture, focusing on the costumes, focusing on the choreography, focusing on being in a group, learning, learning new dance steps from instructors, learning the importance of dance in your culture. The colored ribbons in their hair actually refer to how many weeks they've, they've stayed under their TV budget, too, so that's built in. And here you can see how much they improved over a couple months. But the idea was not to get them into a competitive situation where we're trying to turn them into uh, dancers for a lifetime, but provide them with fun activities that they can do um, and continue. And in fact, most of their parents 
our fathers and mothers would have done these dances as kids growing up in Mexico. Yeah, fun, huh? Another fun one is, uh, is something, this is a, a project that Dana Weintraub has been spearheading, um, in which we've identified uh, team sports programs just for overweight children. So a lot of us have had very positive experiences with team sports uh, growing up because of the competition, because of the being a part of a team. Well, overweight kids often don't get to participate in that because it's too intimidating for them often. They don't want to be um, the last one picked or the slowest one on the field or to gain, they don't have time to gain the, the skills, especially in this competitive world. So, so with, with Dana, we developed uh, an after school um, soccer program just for overweight kids. And this was again in, in East Palo Alto. And we did this uh, study with over a six month period of time. And here are the results presented as in standard deviation units so I could put them all on the same slide. But over a six month period of time, kids randomized, all overweight kids randomized to access to a team sports program versus uh, nutrition education. And we saw significant benefits in BMI as well as physical activity measured objectively. So the next idea was to take stealth interventions to our next level and that is social and ideological movements. And that's when we look at ideas of where people change their behavior and sustain that behavior over time, it tends to be in things like religious movements, social and ideological movements. And we've identified quite a number, working with Christopher, in fact, on, a, on some, some stuff that actually overlap with obesity. So the one that's most obvious, environmental sustainability and climate change, what you do to save the planet is the same thing you would do to, to improve your health. So you get out of your car and walk and bike more, and you start eating lower on the food chain. Uh, less meat, and more fruits and vegetables. And in fact, all of these have overlap in similar ways. So we've done at least one pilot of this, and this is a, um, from a course that Christopher and I lead um, for human biology called Food and Society, in which students who took this course, we actually measured their eating behavior before and after the course and compared it to students who were taking courses that were more directly, human biology courses that were more directly related to obesity and nutrition and public health. And we found that even though there were no differences at baseline uh, in their behaviors or their attitudes, that we had significant improvements in, in their healthful, a total healthful diet score and in the amount of vegetables they ate. Um, and you can see reductions in high fat dairy, meats, sweets, increases in fruits, decreases in processed foods, although those were not significant in the small sample. And also changes in their perceived importance of uh, eating a um, healthful diet, environmental sustainability, and animal rights compared to students taking uh, regular courses around health, even though their motivation at the beginning was the same. So here's our first sort of foray into doing systematically studying this. We're doing some other work on this as well, um, in which we're identifying these stealth interventions that have nothing to do ostensibly with health, but really produce the same behavior changes. Okay, so that's, uh, I think, the end of my 10 minutes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Okay. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.